So, hi. Um, I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Aviv Zohar from the Hebrew University. Um, Aviv did his PhD studies with, uh, at the Hebrew University as well with, um, uh, oh, Rosenstein. What's his first name? I forgot. Jeff Rosenstein. Jeff Rosenstein. Um, he's working um, uh, on, on topics related to game theory, uh, mechanism design, um, multi-agent systems, and various others. But in the recent year, years, I think it's okay, right, to say that his main focus is cryptocurrencies. Yep. Um, he's mostly known for, I'll, I'll tell a few of my personal favorites, as usual. Um, he worked, he designed a, um, a different mechanism for the uh, tie breaking rule in Bitcoin. Bitcoin uses a, a very simple rule called the uh, longest chain rule. So miners mine on top of the uh, longest chains. And it turns out this isn't so good. It's not such a good idea. As it, it, he designed the ghost protocol, which uh, in which miners top on the heaviest um, tip rather than the longest tip, which is a uh, uh, I, of course, I'm not really uh, defining it very well, but I think the intuition is clear. Um, uh, so, and this uh, mechanism uses still uses trees as the underlying mechanism, and from that, that he also introduced a new uh, new techniques which involves um, block dugs, meaning uh, currently blocks are pointing only on their previous, um, only on a single uh, block. So that's why you get a tree structure. And he designed protocols in which um, um, blocks point to several uh, predecessors. And then you get a, 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 a directed a cyclic graph structure and designed a few um, protocols which have uh, even better um, uh, properties than, than that. Uh, and uh, the floor is yours, Aviv. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Lightning Network, which is uh, basically a, a protocol uh, running on top of, of, uh, of Bitcoin. Um, and um, right, so let me try advance right so i'm going to focus on this thing it's a system that's built on top of bitcoin so you don't have to really understand how bitcoin itself works i'm going to explain how how the lightning network uh, works and what it is and then i'm going to describe a series of attacks that we explored in different papers on this protocol and this is going to be based on a joint work with sal tochner stefan schmid Alec mizrahi and john harris uh, now, if you have any questions, just um, you know, interrupt me. I'm I'm not reading the chat. It's hard to uh, to monitor everything. So just you know, open your mic and ask. Go ahead. Um, and I'm just going to get started with explaining the Lightning Network. Okay, so let's start with a, a little uh, introduction about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has a decentralized ledger, basically a record of who owns money, and this ledger is copied at every node of a you know, very large computer network. Right? So each one of these computers remembers uh, how much money every person or every account has. And um, this implies that uh, we have to synchronize this knowledge about accounts. So Bitcoin is really running a consensus protocol over the contents of the ledger, right? So, we, so that all nodes agree on how much money is in every account uh, at any given time. Um, so now Bitcoin's decentralized ledger, uh, unfortunately, we know it scales very poorly, right? Because whenever we have a, you know, a planet scale system that replicates data, the same data everywhere, and it has to be notified, right? If you buy something with Bitcoin, each one of these computers has to change, um, has to change its records. So there's a, you know, networking costs, a lot of storage costs. The, the Bitcoin blockchain is, is very large right now. There's computation that you have to do. You have to validate signatures and every one of these machines has to do it. And the worst yet, you have to do it in a cons you know, within a consensus protocol, which is very slow and very expensive. And that means that Bitcoin transactions are, are very slow. They, they happen, you know, only once every 10 minutes, you, you accept new transactions into the blockchain. 
and uh, their fees can climb up if we run out of space, right? The blocks, block sizes are very limited, so they're very costly. Right, so if we want to use uh, Bitcoin as, as a payment mechanism and really have like an entire world adopt this system, Bitcoin as it's, as it's uh, currently uh, built is not, not enough maybe. And there are some approaches to scaling it up. So one approach is to maybe try and improve on the consensus protocols. And like all said, uh, I've, I've done some work on that uh, before. Another approach is to use a uh, sharding, basically to try to split the data between different nodes and not have every node replicate all of the data. I think this is still considered an open problem in, in uh, public blockchains like, like in Bitcoin. Um, there's another approach that, you, that tries to get to scalability and this is based on delegated computation, right? So if you, if you know about um, this area of zero knowledge proofs and and the ability to prove that you've done computation, there's, there are nice tricks that are being used to scale up uh, cryptocurrency systems. And the last and, and maybe one of the more promising solutions is the Lightning Network that I'm going to talk about now, right? So these are, uh, Lightning, the Lightning Network is the specific instance of these protocols for Bitcoin. Other blockchains have, have similar uh, protocols. But uh, I'm going to talk about Lightning and, and uh, the general class of these protocols is called off-chain payment channels. Um, for reasons Let me of... add quantum money to your list, to your future uh, list. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, if you think it's a scaling solution, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept that, actually. All right. So, so now I, I want to tell you a little bit about how Lightning came to be, but I, I need to just to give a little bit of detail about how the Bitcoin protocol uh, works, not in the consensus layer, but how the ledger is written, basically. So I, I want to tell you how, how do you actually own Bitcoins? What, what does it mean to own a Bitcoin? So the, the Bitcoin ledger, this data that's synchronized between all the nodes, um, associates an amount of money with a small script. You can think of it as a small computer program. Um, here's an example of one. Uh, it has only one operator, check sig, it checks, checks uh, basically a cryptographic signature and it gives a public key. And if you want to move the funds for this, uh, for, you know, this one Bitcoin that's associated here, you have to satisfy the, the, the script basically. Uh, you have to get it to return true in, in some sense. So when you uh, are executing a Bitcoin transaction, basically you have to show a signature on the transaction that matches this public key, right? This is what the script says. And that, and that would allow you to reassign the Bitcoin. So what does it mean to reassign the Bitcoin? You give new records, right? New outputs where, where it's a, 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 an association again of amounts with new scripts, maybe with new public keys that allow you to allow, uh, send the money to somebody else. So if, they, if, they, if it's their public key. Um, and then what happens is when a node receives this transaction together, it, check, it runs the script on the, on the data. Um, and then we remove this uh, money from the ledger and we reassign it with the new scripts in there. So this sort of functionality allows Bitcoin to do things like have accounts that have multiple signatures, right? You, you need to satisfy the script. You can show two, you can require two signatures from two keys and all sorts of functionality, right? And this functionality can get really, really complex. Here's an example of a more complicated Bitcoin script with, with operators. And you can, you can recognize things like hash functions and conditions and so on. Um, and this is, uh, in general, uh, when, when people do uh, stuff with blockchains, they can also, you know, this, is, this has been generalized to tour, more Turing complete languages uh, running on top of uh, Ethereum, for example, and, and so on. Um, so now this, this is the, the backdrop to our, to our uh, situation. We have a problem of scalability and we have this script functionality that allows us to do something. And uh, on top of that, uh, slowly there, was, there were a few ideas on how to move money that, that gave us a layer two solution 
to, uh, to transfers, basically a layer bit on, built on top of Bitcoin. So I'm always going to assume the existence of the blockchain kind of in the background running, and uh, you can always send transactions there and check scripts. Um, and we're going to build a payment system on top of that. So the ideas really were finally put together by uh, Joseph Poon and Taj Dreija. Uh, I think they were both students in uh, Stanford at the time. Um, and there's a really a collection of ideas that evolve over time. It's not all theirs. So the, the key idea to the Lightning Network is that we're going to have a very small set of participants communicate in order to move payments. They're not going to touch the blockchain most of the time. They're only going to settle their accounts on the blockchain at the end of many, many transfers. This is going to help us scale up because we don't have to have the consensus protocol basically running on every transaction. And um, it's going to be much, uh, much cheaper. Any questions uh, thus far before we get started with the protocol? OK. So the basics of the protocol is this thing called the bidirectional channel. Okay, so we're going to have uh, two participants who want to send a lot of payments from one to the other. And what they're going to do is they're going to set up a channel between them. So, so the channel is basically just a joint account. Okay, so let's say each one of them deposits two Bitcoin, uh, uh, sorry, one Bitcoin each, uh, a total of two Bitcoins into a joint account. And when I say a joint account, I mean, they assign it to this uh, script that says that it can be redeemed only if both of them together sign a transaction, right? So both Alice and Bob have to sign some transaction to get the money back. So now, of course, once they put money into the account, their uh, main concern is, that, you know, getting it back at some point. Uh, if Alice creates an account with Bob, Bob might disappear and, and, and she might not get her funds back. So before they actually send the money into this joint account, they prepare in advance a transaction uh, that uh, they both sign that gives them the money back. Okay, so Alice can get one Bitcoin and Bob one Bitcoin and both of them sign it cryptographically and they keep that transaction around to recover their funds. Okay, so that kind of ensures them if against the other side uh, disappearing. Now, what do they do if they want to move money around? Right, so th this transaction is, is kept, it's never sent to the blockchain, right? They keep it uh, on the side only in case of emergency, right? Uh, for uh, if they wanna use it. Um, so the money is still locked on the blockchain basically. And now if Alice wants to move money to Bob, what she can do is basically create a new transaction that allocates these funds instead of one Bitcoin to her and one Bitcoin to Bob, she gives 0 0.9 to herself and 1.1 to Bob. And she signs this and she sends it over to Bob. And now uh, Bob can basically say, you know, I have this transaction. I can always send that to the blockchain and I will have my 1.1 Bitcoins instead of one. So I, I, I can consider this money transferred, except that there is one problem. We still have Alice's old transaction here that gives her the whole uh, Bitcoin and not 0.9. So we have to somehow revoke that one, right? We have to make sure that transaction can no longer be used once Alice promises Bob a little bit more money. Um, so there is a revocation mechanism uh, in the Lightning Network I, that I won't get into the, all the details. It's a little bit messy, but uh, let's assume we're doing something slightly simple. Uh, we have a serial number on every transaction, right? So when Alice and Bob agree to have a split, they put a serial number of maybe zero on the, on the first transaction in the channel. And they say, okay, this, this amount of one Bitcoin each is redeemable after one week if you don't appeal. And we'll see what an appeal is in a second. Um, okay, so, so it's, it's going to be your money, but you have to wait a week to, to, to make sure basically that this is the most recent transaction. So now if Alice wants to send a little bit of money to Bob, she will increment the serial number to one. And this appeal period, right, Bob will be able to show uh, a more recent transaction signed by Alice. If Alice posts this to the blockchain, this old transaction, Bob is going to be able to claim the money that he does uh, own uh, from Alice. So basically there's a little bit of money that was shifted and now this guarantees to Bob that he'll have the money. So he doesn't actually have to send it to the blockchain. He actually keeps this transaction 
in, you know, in, in the memory of his machine. And we, he'll only transmit it if Alice somehow disappears and doesn't give him uh, any more money. Right, so he can always, of course, sign this and send to the blockchain. That's something that's an option for him. So now if Bob wants to send money back to Alice, right, this channel is two directional. He can also increment the serial number and, um, you know, reassign money a little bit more to Alice than to him. And now Alice has a newer transaction with a higher serial number that Bob has signed. And she is guaranteed basically to have 1.3 Bitcoins in this example. Um, okay. Any questions thus far on the protocol? All right, if there are no questions. Um, so now what, what, what did we get? We have um, basically a two-way channel between Alice and Bob that they can use for many, many small payments between them. And this is, the system is completely trustless. You know, Alice and Bob can always claim their money even if the other one isn't cooperative, even if they try to, to, to steal it or cheat. They can make many, many small transfers and they only need two blockchain transactions per channel. They need, they need the blockchain transaction that opens the channel and they need the blockchain transaction that closes the channel and eventually settles all the accounts. So, so that's relatively cheap for, for you know, basically an unlimited amount of transfers that they can do back and forth between them. Um, the payments are very fast. All they have to do is you know, basically communicate with each other which is very fast and you know, they sign some things and validate them. Um, and therefore we can expect there to be very low fees and we can actually support micropayments. We can, we can move fractions and of, of cents around and, and this is uh, fairly cheap. But we did see some uh, limitations of these channels. So one thing is that funds are locked in the channel. You can't use them for other purposes. You have to commit them in advance. And you have to put enough in because the liquidity of the channel, the amount of money in there basically constrains the use. If all of the money has shifted from Alice to Bob, then of course you can't pay him anymore. She's shifted everything that she has in the channel to in his direction. So there, there, these channels are um, limited in some sense. Um, the other limitation is that payments are for now, only between Alice and Bob, right? We didn't see how to do anything else. We have to open channels to other parties. And it's very unlikely that Alice and Bob are just going to you know, bounce around pennies back and forth. So that might be a, a little bit of a problem. And the last thing is that participants need to be online to monitor the blockchain and to appeal. And this is something that's gonna stay around the protocol. Um, but we can delegate this action to somebody else. So there, there, there are protocols called uh, you know, uh, watchtowers that you can give them uh, basically recent versions of your transactions. They can appeal on your behalf if, if somebody um, tries to close a channel with an old transaction and you have a newer one. Um, so now I'm going to talk about this aspect where payments are only between Alice and Bob. I'm, I'm actually going to show you that there's a trick to to allowing payments uh, in, in, uh, to other parties in general. So what we're gonna build on is, is transfers between parties, right? So we're going to allow several hops over, this, over these channels to occur. So uh, the main idea here is that Alice, for example, has a channel with Bob and Bob has a channel with Charlie but Alice doesn't have an, a direct channel to Charlie, but she can, she can still try to pay Charlie, you know, with the assistance of Bob along the way. She might uh, ask Bob to, uh, you know, she, she'll send him a fraction of a Bitcoin um, and Bob will forward this to, uh, to Charlie. And then, right, if you, if you notice, Bob's balance has, you know, increased by 0 0.1 here and decreased by 0 0.1 here. So he basically has the same amount of money. It's just shifted around and, and Charlie got paid indirectly uh, via Bob. So um, we're trying to build a trustless system where nobody can steal your money. So we have to ask who goes first in this case, um, right? If Alice pays Bob and then Bob might not forward the payment to Charlie, he might get Alice's money. And if Bob pays Charlie first, 
you know, he might not get uh, money from Alice, so, so he might lose out. So uh, what we really want is to have these payments done in some atomic manner. So if one is executed, we are guaranteed that the other will be executed as well. So the, the nice trick that's used in the Lightning Network um, is something uh, of this sort. Charlie thinks up, a, right, randomly selects a secret S, right, of many bits, many random bits. And uh, he computes the cryptographic hash of S. He basically hides it in, a, in a, something uh, right, it's, uh, that's non-invertible easily. And he sends this hash H star to Alice. And now Alice can basically write a transaction that splits the money between her and Bob if she wants to send a little bit of money to Bob. She said, I agree to split Right, instead of one Bitcoin for me and 1.2 to Bob, I'm going to give myself 0.9, a little bit less. And Bob still gets the 1.2 guaranteed. But there's also an additional uh, provision here saying that Bob can get this extra 0.1 Bitcoin if he reveals the secret that uh, you know, matches this hash. Right, So H that will give us the H star when we hash it. And this is a condition that you can specify in Bitcoin's script. You can check the hash of something that is, that's given in data and see that it fits. Um, and if Bob doesn't reveal this, then after two days, maybe Alice gets back her 0 0.1 Bitcoins. Okay, so Alice isn't worried about giving Bob this, this guarantee because he can't pull, out, pull the money unless he has the secret. The secret is going to be released by Charlie only when he gets the money from Bob. Now, Bob himself can agree once he's had this promise given to him that if he reveals the secret, he'll get a 0 0.1 Bitcoin. He feels safe. He can say, okay, if I have the secret, I'm going to get paid by Alice. So I can promise Charlie this is 0 0.1 Bitcoin if he gives me the secret. <clears throat> and this um, basically guarantees that... Um, that Bob will be safe. Um, so now what happens is that Charlie has the secret, so he can get this 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Um, it's basically his, right? Once Bob sends him this transaction, this money can be uh, considered uh, to be owned by Charlie. So he will send back the secret to Bob. He'll show him, you, you know, here's the secret, I have it. Um, and now Bob has the secret uh, as well. He can show it to Alice. And everybody knows that effectively the money has been transferred. So, so this um, you know, slightly elaborate setup, these conditional payments here are called HTLCs or hashed time-locked contracts. Uh, and they are the basic mechanism that allows us to use multiple hops and you can use more than just two hops in the Lightning Network. Um, so now you can check and see that if, uh, you know, any two parties try to cheat the third, the, they can't get away with it. Um, for example, if Charlie and Alice try to cheat Bob, right? So what will they do? They can try to take Bob's money, right? So uh, Charlie has this secret S, so he might sign this transaction and send it to the blockchain. And now, um, you know, Bob is going to try and recover his money. So he needs the secret S, to, but, but it's visible on the blockchain. The blockchain can be monitored by everybody who's connected. So he has S by monitoring the blockchain. Now he's guaranteed to have this, these funds. He can also sign this transaction and, and get all the money. Um, you can also look at what happens if Charlie, for example, stalls and tries not to complete the payment. Then after a while, these the, the all these funds re, uh, revert back to to their owner right so you can see that there is a, an expiration date here an expiration date here um but we as i wrote it here that the two-day expiration here and here is not a good idea you actually need expiration dates to be uh, uh, staggered uh so that these transactions expire first before you know the earlier transactions in the path uh, and this is to, keep, to make sure that Bob gets his money from Alice if money is withdrawn from him. If this later transaction expires first, 
then uh, then uh, that means that Charlie can't take money from Bob uh, without Alice, uh, Bob being able to take money from Alice. So this usually has a you know like a one day expiration. This will have a two day expiration expiration on it. So so that's the basis of the Lightning Network. And now just to to assure you, this this network is real, right? It's it's built. It's running. There are a lot of nodes. What you're seeing here is a visualization of the nodes of their location. Um, we know we, you know, it's the the number of nodes has been slowly increasing since uh, the deployment. We have slightly over ten thousand nodes, and the amount of money locked in channels is somewhere around, you know, seventy five million dollars right now, and this is. Um, maybe due to the very large increase in the value of Bitcoin recently. But, uh, you know, this, this, the amount of Bitcoins locked in channels has been, uh, you know, over the last few years, constant, you know, maybe climbing a bit uh, in the past two years. Um, but that means uh, there's a lot of value there, but not still, not still not enough for a very huge payment system, right? So $75 million sounds like a lot, but not for a financial system. So, but, but it's been growing. So this is a good time to ask questions about the protocol because I'm gonna switch over to talk about the attacks um, if there are no questions. Yeah, I, I do have a question. Um, how can we make sure that it's, that like, let's say that one of the nodes, either Charlie or Bob, like wants to cheat someone else. Yeah. How can we make sure that the computational time that it takes to like steal the secret without without like giving it back yeah is is more costly than actually obeying by the laws of the the protocol so so the secret right the secret is usually something like 256 bits long so it's you know and, and what you were using is cryptographic hash functions so, you know, if you can break cryptographic hash functions, you can ruin a lot of protocols. Uh, but basically the time it would take you if, if you're brute forcing it is, you know, uh, something on the order of uh, two to the two, 256 uh, computational steps, right? So if the bits are really chosen at random uh, and you're doing this well, um, then, then it's impossible to, to steal. And, and the amounts of money that we're talking about here are small to begin with these are intentionally intentionally small amounts right so that's a that's the main idea does that answer the question yes thank you okay any more questions by anybody okay i'm 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 gonna go on if there are no questions um so the first thing I, I want to show you, right, I, I want to show you basically a th series of three papers uh, that each one of them tried a different route of uh, attack on, on, this, on this protocol because we really liked it, right? It's, re it's a really nice protocol. And, and I think these things should be tested, should kick the tires a little bit to see if you can break them. Um, so one, uh, one attack is basically, bas uh, you know, trying to, to manipulate the routing mechanism for, for the Lightning Network. And this is joint work with Stefan Schmidt and, and Sal Tochner. Um, so the idea here is, is first you need to understand how routing works in, light, in the Lightning Network. So the routes in the Lightning Network are chosen by the sender. Okay, the sender just says, you know, here's the path I want to take through the network. That, that also means he has to know the entire network and, and uh, uh, so he can, he can uh, basically uh, find a path. Um, right, so the, the sender does know the network structure. This is advertised by the nodes. Uh, the, he knows the total liquidity of the channels, not the current liquidity, but the total liquidity. Um, uh, and he knows the fees that each one is going to take, right? So, so a certain node along the way doesn't actually move the, the, the money uh, for free. They, they take a small fraction of it as, as, as a commission for, for their work. Uh, and this incentivizes them to, to actually you know, connect the network and add liquidity to, to channels. Um, so the routing is actually a little bit like Tor routing, it's onion routing. So every node knows the previous hop and the next hop, but doesn't know necessarily know this, you know, the sender and the, and the target. So there's an attempt to preserve a little bit of anonymity so you don't know who's paying who. Uh, and now here's the, the, the main idea of the attack. 
what we're going to do is we're going to try and connect to the network with, with a, a node or uh, several nodes. And uh, we're going to form channels that say, you know, we, we're going to charge very low fees, okay, extremely low fees. And we attract uh, traffic basically through our node. Okay, so uh, everybody who, who who's promised a low fee is going to go through our node. Um, uh, right, because uh, everybody else is charging more money. And then what we're going to do once they route through us is we're going to perform a denial of service attack. We're not going to relay their payments. We're just going to get the HDLC. We're not going to continue. And they're going to have to wait until expiration of these uh, ti uh, hash time lock contracts. Okay, so, and after expiration, they'll try to route again. And if we've done our job well, they route again and they still choose a low fee route and they still go through our, the attack. Okay, so that's a very simple uh, attack. Um, and uh, what we went and did is we went to evaluate the routing algorithms of the implementations of Lightning. So there are three main implementations that are out there. LND, C Lightning, and Eclair. These are, uh, you know, uh, basically companies, uh, different companies who wrote um, the the code for for the Lightning protocol. Um, and each one of the implementations uses some complex formula to define a weight on each channel in the network. But eventually, every channel gets assigned a number, and they are looking for a min weight path. So the weight of each channel involves things like the fee, so they're trying to minimize the cost, but also things like the delay, how long uh, does it take to, for money to, uh, how, how long is the HDLC locked for, uh, and they try to minimize that, and the, the, there's a different formula for each one. I, I won't go into the details, as, as, as you see, it's a little bit complicated. Um, but every one of these implementations has a, a way to try and avoid picking the shortest or lowest cost route, consistently, right? Because, you know, if this you try to route through this path and it failed, then you're going to want to try another route um, and not pick the same one, which just failed. Um, so for LND, they're trying to have a penalty term on, 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 uh, on edges that, that failed us before. Uh, C Lightning uh, tries to add random noise to the weight function at, at different places. And Eclair just picks it randomly from the three best routes. Um, so all of these routing algorithms are basically susceptible to, to the attack because they, the, when, when they, you know, C Lightning does fuzzing, they do too, too little of it. Um, and LND's decaying penalty term decays too fast, you know, within, you know, it decays exponentially fast. And picking from the three best routes, it doesn't help you if all three routes go through the attacker. Um, so I'll show you the, the results in a second, but what, what we went and did is we looked at the Lightning Network and you can get statistics on the fees because everybody publishes them. Uh, so you see the different channel fees, right? There, there, are, there are amounts that are very well represented because these are just defaults that are there for each implementation. Um, and you can see the time of delay and uh, right. Uh, so fees are, are, are usually uh, made out of two parts, uh, proportional fee, uh, depending on the size of the payment and a constant fee for the transfer. Um, and there you can look at the channel capacities. There are various statistics that, that we can utilize. And now uh, what we have to do is we have to choose where to connect in the network, right? Where do we want to be connected? So we have to pick a set of uh, nodes in the Lightning Network to connect to. Uh, and if you think about the attacks, it's not really surprising uh, finding the best set of nodes that the attacker should connect to in a, in a graph with fees is, is an NP-complete problem, right? It's very hard to, to compute the optimal uh, uh, location. But uh, what we use is a greedy approach. We just try to maximize the, uh, you know, each edge at a time the amount of traffic, uh, the amount of nodes that we, we, we manage to route through, through the attacker. And the greedy approach works really well here because um, the success level of the attack is a submodular function. So we can basically do submodular optimization and we get a good approximation for the, for the optimal attack. So now when you look at the different implementations, you can see that very few links 
right? This is based on the Lightning Network of, of I guess, uh, uh, maybe a year ago or, uh, or so. Um, you know, we add a very few links and we hijack a very high percentage of the paths. So if we add maybe five links, we've hijacked pretty much 80% uh, of, of paths between different pairs. And you can see that all three implementations here are vulnerable uh, when, when we try to, to, uh, to target them. And uh, one thing that we, another thing that we did is we, we used a random strategy, just connecting to random nodes instead of picking optimal ones. And you can see this uh, graph here also still allows us to hijack some stuff. The difference between you know, doing something randomly and not basically implies that something about the topology could be improved, not just the routing protocols. So the fact that we can uh, do better than, much better than random, I think, implies something about the topology. Um, and now, once we have these hijacked routes, uh, we just delay until the HTLC expiration. And uh, what I should say is that the HTLC expiration is actually on the order of hours or days. So when you try to make a payment, your money is stuck in that channel waiting until the HTLC expires and you have to wait for days. So this is really, really uh, powerful in terms of an attack. Um, so now there's, this kind of leaves us with an open question about uh, routing. You know, can we design something where no hijacking like this is possible, but still we want people to choose low cost routes and we want to have uh, you know, the nodes on the network earn enough money. So I think things at the intersection, this is, I think this is an open problem to find a, an algorithm that does this. So and can I ask a question about the, the protocol? If I understand correctly, there are no costs for the attacker other than liquidity, right? Because the, the uh, person attacked wouldn't uh, publish the transaction on the blockchain, they'll just wait, right? And yes, therefore, no, nothing yeah. needs to be uh, updated on the blockchain. There are no fees associated with it, etc. Right, and the and the liquidity you have to put in is is relatively low because yeah, all you have to do is put in the amount of liquidity is sufficient for the payment to for the payment to be routed. There's there's no there's no check that you have much more liquidity than the payment, for example. Okay. Um, so if you want to hijack, you know, 0 0.1 bitcoins, you put 0 0.1, you know, all transactions of 0 0.1 bitcoin or below. You, you build channels of 0 0.1 bitcoins. Um, so, so that's fairly cheap, I think. Um, so, so I think this is, uh, you know, th this is really an active uh, line of uh, um, development for these protocols. Some of them are still evolving their, uh, uh, their routing protocols. Um, so I want to switch over to the next attack. This attack is basically a congestion attack. So we're kind of following the motif of, of networks, right? So how do you attack networks? One way is to, is, is to attack the routing layer. One way is to somehow attack the transport layer and, uh, and get congestion in there. Um, and this is work, work done with Ayelet Mizrahi. Um, so now what, what, we want to what we need to understand about the Lightning Protocol is that if you're routing several payments through this edge at the same time, the transaction size increases, right? There are all these um, conditions on, on payments that are slowly being added until they are resolved. If the secrets propagate back, then these get erased from these transactions or the transaction re gets replaced. But as long as the secret hasn't propagated back, we are adding more and more conditions, more secrets that you know, Bob needs to give in order to, to get money. So HTLC, the number of HTLCs grows. Um, Right, so if the secret, of course, is propagated back, then we'll erase them. But if the secrets aren't propagated, we're stuck with this really, really large transaction that we're going to have to post to the blockchain. Um, so uh, these HTLCs, I remind you, take you know days to expire, up to two weeks. This is a constant in the protocol that was you know a, a, maybe a default value in the protocol, um, and when you have 483 transfers like these open at the same time, you, your transaction is so large that it doesn't fit into a Bitcoin block anymore. So there's a maximal number of open connections that you can have on a channel that is 483. And this is a limitation set by the blockchain, right? There's, there's a limit to the size of transactions you can send. 
Um, so now you can probably guess what the attack is. We're gonna connect to the network with the attacker. We're going to request many transfers to, from, you know, from one attacker to the other, or from one attacker not to the other, or we actually do this in circles. That's also fine. Um, and we do 483 payment requests that are for the minimal amount that we can, right? Basically the smallest amount we, we can transfer. Um, and we are allowed to do 20 hops in the network. So all paths have to be 20 hops or low or, or, or below that. And then the end node, which is an attacker node, just doesn't propagate the secrets back. So we've reached the maximal transaction size on every channel and the channel is effectively blocked until all these HTLCs expire, which is again for hours or days, right? More, more uh, uh, towards the days. And, and basically if we do this many, many times, we can start to cut up the network and make it uh, uh, so that nodes can't transfer payments from each other, or we can isolate individual nodes. So, so this is basically uh, what we did. So what I'm showing you here in this table is the default values for each one of the implementations of Lightning, right? We talked about LNDC, Lightning and Eclair. So the, max, the lock time max is the number of blocks for which these HTLC, HTLCs remain locked. So we have a number of 200, uh, 2016 blocks. Uh, and if you remember in Bitcoin, every block uh, takes around 10 minutes to, to produce. So two, two, 2016 is uh, roughly two weeks uh, time. So you have to wait for two weeks until, you know, at the maximum of two weeks until HTLCs expire. And then another interesting number here is the number of concurrent HTLCs. And this, the, the, the Bolt here, Bolt is the, you know, kind of an RFC document for, for, the, for the Lightning Protocol. Uh, it basically specifies that it has to be under 483 and different implementations have set it either to 483 or to 30. Um, fortunately for us, the vast majority of nodes in the Lightning Network are uh, LND nodes. So they use the number of 483 and we can almost ignore the other two implementations because they didn't have a lot of nodes deployed, um, at, at least at the time when we wrote the paper. So like something like 95% of the nodes are LND nodes. Um, and then what we do is we open a lot of these channels at, at you know, strategically uh, selected locations. And as we, with each channel, we manage to lock up uh, more and more uh, channels along the, in the network. And the first experiment that we did is we tried to simulate what it would be like if we were to lock the channels that had the highest liquidity, right? So what we're trying to do is lock up as much funds from being used to transfer um, and so you can see here the fraction of the, the total liquidity of the network that we can uh, block, right? That's the y-axis as a function of the number of attacker channels that we open. So the attacker slowly opens more and more channels to different places in the network. Then he can um, uh, basically block up more and more of the network. And the different lines that are almost overlapping here is the amount of time that we managed to lock them for. So if, for example, if we're trying to lock them up for six days, we have to, there are all sorts of constraints on the channel that we have to pick to, for it to be locked for six days. We're still locking almost the same amount as if we're trying to lock for one day. So, so what you're seeing is, is that this attack is very, very effective. Um, another experiment that we did is we tried to slice up the network, just have as many pairs of nodes uh, be disconnected from each other. That, that means that they have no path of payment at all to each other. So we, we even disregarding the routing protocol that will pick shortest paths, uh, we, they have no path at all to, to each other. Um, so uh, you can see here in a, the green line is a, a, you know, a specific algorithm that we used, uh, the Kenningham Lean algorithm to, to choose which edges we wanted to attack. Um, and that basically said that after we open a thousand channels to the network, we're you know, able to reduce the fraction of connected pairs to 20%, right? And if we open 2000, you know, it's you know, below 10%, below 5%. Um, so basically we break up the network with a thousand or 2000 channels. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the costs of this attack. Um, as, as we open uh, more channels, we have to pay uh, two different 
types of costs. So the first cost is fees that we have to pay on the blockchain, right? We have to give uh, a, a, a fees for, for opening channels. And this is uh, the area not denoted here in blue. And there's, uh, we also need to lock liquidity in our channels to allow us to request 483 payments that are of the minimal value. And uh, so this is uh, this brown area here. And you have to recall that the brown area is not really a cost that we incur permanently in some sense. This is money that's locked in the channel, but it remains in the hands of the attacker. It, you can basically get it back. You can withdraw it. Um, so the, the, you, you, you're losing some interest on this, but it's relatively negligible compared to the blockchain fees. So what happens is that you know when you want to lock up a lot of the capacity, right? If you want to lock up, you know, something like 800 Bitcoins, you have to pay far less than, you know, half a Bitcoin in, in liquidity, uh, in, in fees to open channels and run this attack. And once you've opened channels and you ran this attack, you can keep on running it without paying again because you already have the channels established. You can just request new transfers with HSCs and, and block up uh, every payment. Um, Okay, any questions on, on this attack? How are we with time? We have, I think we have four minutes. Um, so I'm gonna try and show you the last attack, uh, which is joint work with Jonah Harris. I'll try to do that quickly. So the idea with uh, this attack is that we're going to try to hit this protocol at the point where uh, players go to the blockchain Right, we are we are assured that you you get money, but you have to interact with the blockchain in order to re reclaim funds if the other guy is cheating you. So we're going to have everybody try to access the blockchain and to try to post transactions there at the same time, and and we're going to cause congestion basically because we're going to run this attack in parallel on many many victims, and this attack actually allows us to steal money from the victims, not just to block up the network we are actually going to steal money from them. Um, and, and I think that's uh, relatively severe given, you know, if you think about the uh, Lightning Network with its $75 million locked in there, maybe we can make a, a few bucks. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're going to connect to a victim from two sides. Um, we actually don't have to be, uh, we have to connect to him, you know, uh, from once uh, with one node, but the other can be a little bit further away. That doesn't really matter, but we connect to the victim. Um, then we're going to ask for a lot of payments uh, from our attacker uh, node to, to, the other, to the other attacker node. And uh, that means we have very, very large transactions here with HCLCs that are waiting for the secrets to be enumerated uh, and basically sent back to, for, to complete the payments. Now, our attacker node is going to send the secrets back, okay, after this is established. And once the secrets are, are shown to this intermediate node, it, it behaves uh, naively, it, it, it simplifies this transaction. It says, okay, this, this guy at the end has all the secrets, I can just give him the money. So they switch this transaction to give him a, this, the, the correct split without all the conditioning on the secrets. That's how the protocol works. Now this guy expects the, the next guy to do the same thing. He requests you know, the, the, that these uh, secrets be simplified from the transaction, but our uh, bad guy node here stops interacting, doesn't talk anymore. Okay, so he refuses to sign a new transaction. So this guy, if he wants all this money, he, he has the secrets, he can claim it, um, but he has to interact with the blockchain, right? So, so now we close this channel on the blockchain, right? It's very simple to do. It's a very, uh, small transaction. And this guy is now forced to close the channel with this very, very large transaction. He's, uh, and he has to enumerate all of these secrets. And he has a limited amount of time to do it in because all of these HLCs, if I, I remind you, expire after a little while. <coughs> so something like... Uh, after a few hours, maybe all of them uh, will will uh, will become uh, useless to him, which means that we took the money by you know this attacker gets the money from the victim, but this attacker didn't pay him, right? So this is how we steal money. We make money on this uh, thing. 
So we're going to execute this in parallel many times. So these very large transactions actually compete with one another. They get in each other's way um, and not, not all of them make it into the blockchain. And once we reach the expiration of these HTLCs, uh, the attacker is going to claim them for himself. Okay, so the victim basically fails to recover all the funds and, and uh, the, as a result of the blockchain congestion that we cause. Um, so now one, one thing that we had to do is we had to form connections to the victims. So we checked how many nodes actually in the network would allow us to connect to them. And we you know, started a handshake uh, with each one of them and 95% of nodes say yes, they are willing to connect. So it's very easy to find victims. Um, the ones who said no are predominantly because the request timed out or because they are uh, not ready. They're syncing the blockchain. So um, these are not reasons, you know, these are reasons that are temporary. If you, know, if you wait a while, they'll probably let you connect to them anyway. Um, so, so it's very easy to find victims for this attack. Because the protocol is trustless, nodes generally allow everyone to connect to them without being very discerning. So, so now this is uh, basically, you know, what we need to do to, to, to steal money. Uh, so uh, the X axis here is the number of attacks we are doing in parallel. So if we're attacking many, many victims, right? So here we are attacking um, something like 80 victims at the same time. And uh, the Y axis is how many HTLCs we managed to steal. Okay, so we ran, actually ran this experiment. This is, these are the results of experiments on a, like a small Bitcoin network running with the actual Bitcoin code, but we didn't run it on the main network. We, we kind of built our own test network and, and used the code just to make sure that we can do the attack. And after 80 victims, all the HLCs just don't fit into blocks um, and that's it. So the, the green line that you see here is the actual block size of Bitcoin. So anything above 80 victims allows you to take up all of the Bitcoin block. If half of the block is available, you're, it's sufficient to, to go for 40 victims or so. And if a quarter of the block is available, you can go for something like 20. Um, and in general, there are other Bitcoin transactions out there. So you can't expect the whole Bitcoin block to be full. So something like a half is a, is a good expectation. Um, and uh, the next thing that we did is we checked how much of the Bitcoin block uh, the, the defenders would actually be able to, to, to claim. So the interesting thing is that when these transactions for withdrawing money are created, the, the transaction to withdraw the money of the HSC has to be signed both by the attacker and the victim. So it's created in advance uh, and kept by the victim, and it has a certain uh, fee that it promises to pay, the transaction that allows the victim to pull uh, money. Uh, so what we, what we noticed is that the fees in Bitcoin, right, are going up and down all the time, and we can try and create these transactions when the fee is low, and then refuse to replace them. And the attacker's transaction, on the other hand, has to just be signed by the attacker, only him. This is a very strange quirk of the Lightning Protocol. And he can, of course, because he can sign the transaction himself, he can increment the fee. He can give more money to withdraw a, a transactions on his side. So that basically meant that if we waited for seven days or so, we usually could get half of the Bitcoin block only to victims and we could really steal funds. So I think I ran out of time, so I'll stop here. Uh, maybe I'll get to my last slide. There are more attacks that I would have uh, kind of mentioned that are not in our papers and some economic questions. But, but in general, the takeaways that I want you to have is that uh, the Lightning Network is kind of a very cool second layer system built on top of Bitcoin. It's, it's very rich and very interesting in itself. It has many, many issues left to resolve. And in my opinion, it's not ready yet to, to bear the full burden of scaling Bitcoin, but it's evolving uh, very fast. And you know, all these problems that I've shown you, maybe uh, we can find solutions to them. So at this point, I'll, I'll stop and uh, thank you. Thank you. Any questions on, on any of this? 
So I'll ask, uh, Yaakov asked a question uh, previously, uh, what prevents someone from um, <clears throat> sending the version zero, um, or the, the, what was the uh, word you used there? Uh, I guess version. A and uh, how does it help th uh, that there's another uh, more uh, la uh, later version of that transaction and how does it prevent theft? So, so the, uh, the, the idea is that when you send a transaction, you don't get the payments instantly. You have to wait for a week. And during that week, anybody who shows up with a newer version that is signed uh, can, can preempt you, can basically take the money himself. Okay, so if you use an old version, then the other guy that has a newer version can, can, has, a, has a limited amount of time to, to appeal, basically. Okay, does, does that answer the question? Okay. Um, any more, any more questions? questions? Um, uh, I have a question actually. Um, what about L2, uh, E-L-T-O-O, in regards of the last attack you mentioned? Because I know you can set the, the fees dynamically there. Does it help against the attack you mentioned, uh, the last attack you mentioned? So, so we did. We really didn't evaluate this for L2. I, I will say that you know the, the the basic idea that there is congestion on the blockchain, and and you can't uh, you know fill it up with appeals, can will kind of hold anyway, right? That's that's a problem. Uh, you could try to manipulate L2. I haven't looked at the details of how you know L2 would set the fees and do all these things. Right, setting the fees, but I will say that setting the fees dynamically is even possible for, for uh, the conventional lighting protocol. You can do things like child pays for parent, if you know that. And child pays for parent will allow you to withdraw transactions, even if you didn't put enough fees for them. But the, the cost is that you are increasing the congestion even more because you're adding an extra transaction that, that takes a, a, that tries to, to, to do the withdrawal. And um, that's so that, that's one thing. And on and on the and on the other side is the attacker. The attacker is willing to put to post very very high fees, up to the amount of money that he's stealing because it's not his money. He doesn't care. So he can at the very least make you you know burn all your money, in the channel. Yeah. Um, yeah so L two. I uh, the bottom line is you you have to look at it more carefully. I, I we didn't do that. And sorry for for those that are not. Uh, I don't know what L two is. I've heard the the name, but I'm not sure, even sure what it is. So so there. Are, so L two is a, is another a protocol that tries to do basically similar stuff. I see. So it's an alternative to the Lightning Network. It's L two is a kind of a pun on Layer two, right? It's called e, it's spelled E L T O O, but it's a Layer two. Okay. Yes. Um, any more questions? Sorry, I have a few actually. First of all, have you seen these attacks uh, in the wild? Um, others, of course. So not yet. I, I think there's relatively little motivation right now to attack because uh, let's be honest, the Lightning Network doesn't connect too many systems to one another. Um, they, I, I will say that the developers have been really interested in, in these things uh, and they're kind of taken to heart that you need to, to, to do some modifications for the protocols. Um, I, I, we, we, did some, we did make some suggestions. In each, paper, in each paper, we have some mitigations that we, we proposed, and some of them were discussed in other contexts. So I think, I think uh, we, we contributed a lot to the discussion on what to do and how to evolve the, the standards there. And why does the flood and loot isn't in the wild? It seems like this is a practical attack where you can gain money. Why not? Uh, honestly, I, I think surprised it, it like can it's just, just be done. I think you can just do it. It's very, I think it's relatively easy to do, you know, you, and you'll actually uh, gain money, right? You're saying, uh, yeah. you're, you expect this to be successful for the, I mean, what you need to do is you need to lock up funds that are, uh, uh, you know, on the same order of magnitude that of the funds that you're stealing. Sure. Right. So, so it's so if you're going to make a lot of money, you're going to put up a lot of money in advance. 
Um, and it's gonna might be harder to get away with because once the funds are stolen, you know, today exchanges sure. the, uh, kind sure, of block sure, sure. stolen funds and so on. Sure, 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 sure. Okay, uh, last question. In terms of design goals, it seems, first of all, I, I, I think I told you it before, it seems like the design goals of, um, one of the design goals of the uh, Lightning Network is kind of privacy. And I think that should definitely be removed. It seems like this is an overkill. We can't achieve much more standard notions of security. Uh, privacy should be the last priority at this point. But it seems like most of the attacks are, aren't even about that, right? Even if the if you kind of removed all design goals related to privacy, like the Tor network and uh, yeah, yeah. Probably, still the, the attacks would work. So I'm, I'm wondering if the only way to resolve it is um, kind of like to move to to switch to a hub and spoke kind of model uh, which which i don't know it seems for me that these attacks wouldn't work in a hub and spoke model maybe i'm wrong here mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so that's one possible direction and the other well are there any other directions so maybe I should first say that, you know, hub and spoke is something that the network gravitates towards uh, anyway because of economic incentives in some sense. You know, you prefer short sure. paths and, you know, sure. hubs give you very short paths. On the other hand, uh, they, they are very costly in terms of liquidity. You have to lock liquidity for every edge um, uh, yourself as, as the hub. You have to match the liquidity that people are, are locking. Uh, so that might be a little expensive, but but you, but uh, but you're right that it will mitigate these attacks. On the other hand, it will open the door if you just you know you you uh, DDoS the um, the hub, then the network doesn't work. So you have to build a lot of redundancy there, and um, it's it's a single point of failure, right? You don't want that. Somehow you wanted something trustless that will still operate well. So so. Um, it's it, it it needs to be distributed and decentralized and all these things and the hub and spoke model isn't. Um, I and I will say about privacy. One of the attacks I wanted to mention is you know the there is there's the utter lack of privacy in this protocol. I can I, maybe I can show this slide um, for a second. It's it's a very very short slide, right? So so what you can do uh, this is this is the slide. Um, Right. Let's say you're connected somewhere on the network, not necessarily uh, uh, close to these nodes. You can ask for a payment to be routed through through an edge. Right. So let's say there is a total of two two bitcoins locked here, and you want to know where these bitcoins are allocated. Right. So you can ask to relay one bitcoin, for example, and they say, you know, one of the nodes says, no, I can't. I don't have enough liquidity. And then you can try again with a different amount. Uh, and they say, uh, okay, we'll route your payment. And then you just cancel the payment. You, so you don't even have to move money, right? But now you, you, you say, okay, th there's between 0 0.8 and one Bitcoin liquidity in this channel. And the, you do queries, you basically do binary search, right? Um, and then you know the amount of liquidity on each uh, edge. And you can repeat this many times for all edges. And just you, you, you know, and whenever somebody makes a transfer, you can see the entire route change, right? So, so you, you can you leak information like crazy, right? So this is a this is a, a, an attack, a well-known attack. Uh, I think there are two papers or so that that explore it. Um, so. Even with the Tor uh, anonymity and everything, you can basically connect the dots with free queries that allow you to monitor the network for payments. Um, and especially if you're targeting specific nodes, you can do it even better, right? You don't have to uh, do the whole graph. Um, and given that you know how the routing works, that's you know even easier. Um, and 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 so right, there's, there's no privacy here, right? It's it's completely non-private. They, they try to do Tor routing, and we know that Tor itself is not private. For all all of the Tor attacks also work here. Like you correlate if you're twice on the path, you can correlate uh, uh, payments and so on, and you see amounts. The amounts are, are visible to everybody on the, on the path and so on. Um, so so the privacy is really botched here, and I think one of the problems is that they, they kept the layers instead of separate, right? In, in the internet, you have a routing layer which is separate from the onion routing that's on top of it, right? Tor runs on top of it, a, a lower le level routing on BGP or something. Uh, and here, everything is kind of connected together. The fee system and the, and the routing and everything is in one layer basically and tied together in a very specific configuration. Now you can't change anything. 
Um, so I think that's, that's a bad design choice on their part. Um, yeah, but, but then I don't, you know, it's, it's, it'll, it'll be harder to make a, like a more concrete suggestion. You basically are rebuilding the internet, but for lightning payments here uh, in terms of this, uh, pro, uh, layers and protocol stack. Okay. All right. So thank you very much, Aviv. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me.